Chapter Sixteen of The Adventures of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Sixteen. Millie's Wedding. It don't seem right somehow," muttered Bindle as he stood before the oval mirror of what a misguided Fulham tradesman had catalogued as an elegant Duchess dressing table in walnut substitute. A concertina. That don't seem just right for a wedding. Bindle readjusted the crush hat that had come to him as part of the properties belonging to the Oxford adventure. He tried it on the back of his head, over his eyes, and at the Sir David Beatty angle. Oh, get out of the way, do. We shall be late. Mrs. Bindle, in petticoat and camisole, pushed Bindle aside and took her place in front of the mirror. Anybody would think you was a woman standing looking at yourself in front of the glass. What'll Mr. Hearty say if we're late? You need never be afraid of what Ordeal'll say, remarked Bindle philosophically, because he'll never say anything what can't be printed in a parish magazine. Mrs. Bindle sniffed and continued patting her hair with the palm of her hand. Bindle still stood regarding his crush hat regretfully. You can't wear a hat like that at a wedding, snapped Mrs. Bindle. That's for a dress suit. Bindle heaved a sigh. I'd a like to have worn a top hat at Milliken's wedding, he remarked with genuine regret. But as you'd say, Mrs. B., he remarked, regaining his good humour, God has ordained otherwise, so it's a hard at for J. B. today. Remember you're going to chapel, Bindle, remarked Mrs. Bindle, and it's a sin to enter the house of God with blasphemy upon your lips. Is it really? was Bindle's only comment, as he produced the hard hat and began to brush it with the sleeve of his coat. This done, he took up a position behind Mrs. Bindle, bent his knees, and proceeded to fix it on his head, appropriating to his own use such portion of the mirror as could be seen beneath Mrs. Bindle's left arm. Oh, get away, do! Mrs. Bindle turned on him angrily, but Bindle had achieved his object and had adjusted his hat at what he felt was the correct angle for weddings he next turned his attention to a large white rose which he proceeded to force into his buttonhole this time he took up a position on mrs bindle's right and going through the same process managed to get the complete effect of the buttonhole plus the hat he next proceeded to draw on a pair of canary-coloured wash leather gloves this done he picked up a light cane heavily adorned with yellow metal and mrs bindle having temporarily left the mirror he placed himself before it personally myself he remarked i don't see that charlie'll have a sportin chance to-day lord i pays for dressin he remarked popping quickly aside as mrs bindle bore down upon him you ought to be a proud woman to-day mrs b he continued there's many a fair art what'll flutter as i walks up the aisle mrs bindle's head however was enveloped in the folds of her skirt which she was endeavouring to assume without rumpling her hair ah oh, mrs b bindle said reprovingly late again late again he proceeded to bite off the end of a cigar which he lit don't smoke that cigar snapped mrs bindle not smoke a cigar at a weddin exclaimed bindle incredulously then if you can't smoke a cigar at a weddin when the ell can you smoke one don't you use those words at me retorted mrs bindle if you smoke you'll smell of smoke in the chapel the only smell i ever smelt in the chapel is its own smell and that ain't a pleasant one anyhow i'll put it out before i gets to the door i'm just going to op round to see millikins you'll do nothing of the kind cried mrs bindle with decision you mustn't see a bride before she appears at the chapel bindle stopped dead on his way to the door and turning round exclaimed mustn't what you mustn't see a bride before she appears at the chapel or church it isn't proper well i'm blowed cried bindle you mean to tell me that charlie dixon ain't going to nip round and have a look at her this morning certainly not said mrs bindle but why persisted bindle because it's not proper it's not the right thing to do replied mrs bindle as she struggled into her bodice now ain't that funny said bindle oh, i suppose it all came about because they was afraid the chap might sort of funk it and do a bunk not liking the looks of the gal anyhow that ain't likely to appen with millikins the cove what gets her has got a winner i thought you didn't believe in marriage said mrs bindle acidly 
oh i don't mrs b replied bindle leastways the marriages what are made in the place where they don't play billiards but this little one was made in the putney cinema pavilion i made it myself and when j b takes a thing in hand it's going to be top ole then he proceeded after a pause millikins has got me to look after her if her man don't make her appy i'd skin him yes and rub salt in afterwards there was a grimness in bindle's voice that caused mrs bindle to pause in the process of pinning a brooch over her bodice yes mrs b continued bindle that little gal means an ell of a lot to me i mrs bindle looked round a little startled at a huskiness in bindle's voice she was just in time to see him disappear through the bedroom door when she returned to the looking-glass the face that was reflected back to her was that of a woman in whose eyes there was something of disappointment and cheated longing mrs bindle proceeded with her toilette everything seemed to go wrong and each article she required appeared to have hidden itself away finally she assumed her bonnet a study in two tints of green constructed according to the inevitable plan upon which all her bonnets were built narrow of gauge with a lofty superstructure she gave a final glance at herself in the glass and sighed her satisfaction at the sight of the maroon-coloured dress with the bright green bonnet when mrs bindle emerged into fenton street working her white kid gloves with feverish movement she found bindle engaged in chatting with a group of neighbours here comes my little beetroot remarked bindle at which mrs rogers went off into a shriek of laughter and told him to go on do mrs bindle acknowledged the salutations of her neighbours with a frigid inclination of her head she strongly objected to bindle's holding any truck with the occupants of other houses in fenton street well well so long all of you said bindle it ain't my weddin that's one thing there were cheery responses to bindle's remarks and sotto voce references to mrs bindle as a stuck-up cat mind you throw that cigar away before we get to the chapel said mrs bindle still working at her gloves right o said bindle as they turned into the new king's road he waved the hand containing the cigar in salutation to the driver of a passing motor bus with whom he was acquainted i wish you wouldn't do that said mrs bindle snappishly wouldn't do what inquired bindle innocently recognizing common people when you're with me was the response but that was airy sales said bindle puzzled at mrs bindle's attitude he ain't common he drives a motor bus what will people think demanded mrs bindle oh they're used to airy driving a bus replied bindle they might think it funny if he was to drive an earse you know what i mean said mrs bindle why can't you remember that you're going to a wedding nobody wouldn't know it from your looks mrs b commented bindle you look about as happy as artie does when he ears there's going to be an air raid oh don't talk to me snapped mrs bindle and they continued on their way in silence when about a hundred yards from the alton road chapel mrs bindle demanded of bindle that he throw away his cigar which he did with great reluctance there was a small collection of women and children outside the chapel doors there exclaimed mrs bindle suddenly where inquired bindle looking first to the right and left and then on the ground and finally up at the sky i knew we should be late said mrs bindle there's the carriage at that moment a two-horse carriage bearing mr hearty and millie passed by and drew up at the entrance to the chapel mr hearty's white kid-gloved hand appeared out of the window fumbling with the handle of the carriage a moment later his silk hat adorned with a deep black band appeared still the carriage door refused to open suddenly as if out of sheer mischief it gave way and mr hearty lurched forward his hat fell off and rolled under the carriage a stray dog that had been watching the proceedings dashed for the hat just at the moment that mr hearty hurriedly stepped out to retrieve his headgear mr hearty's foot came down upon the dog's paw the animal gave a heart-rending howl mr hearty jumped the people laughed and the dog continued to howl holding up its wounded paw mr hearty however was intent upon the recapture of his hat with his silver-mounted umbrella he started poking beneath the carriage to try and coax it towards him an elderly gentleman seeing the mishap had approached from the other side of the carriage and with his stick was endeavouring to achieve the same object the result was that as soon as one drew the hat towards him the other immediately snatched it away again it's a game of hockey said bindle who had come up at this moment go it arty you got it 
Mrs. Bindle tore at Bindle's arm, just as the benevolent gentleman succeeded in securing Mr. Hardy's hat. Mr. Hardy dashed round to the other side of the carriage, snatched his damaged headgear from the hands of the stranger, and stood brushing it upon the sleeve of his coat. "'Excuse me, sir,' said the stranger. "'But it's my hat,' said Mr. Hearty, endeavouring to restore something of its lost glossiness. Mr. Hearty had apparently forgotten all about the bride, and it was Bindle who helped Millie from the carriage, and led her into the chapel. Mrs. Bindle reminded Mr. Hearty of his duty. Putting his hat on his head, he entered the chapel door. It was Mrs. Bindle also who reminded him of his mistake. "'It's a good omen, Uncle Joe,' whispered Millie, as she clung to Bindle's arm. "'What's a good omen, Millikins?' "'That you should take me in instead of father,' she whispered, just as Mr. Hearty bustled up and relieved Bindle. There was a craning of necks and a hum of voices as Mr. Hearty, intensely nervous, led his daughter up to the altar. Bindle followed, carrying Mr. Hearty's hat and umbrella. "'My, don't his nibs look smart!' Bindle muttered to himself, as he caught sight of Charlie Dixon standing at the further end of the chapel. The Reverend Mr. Sopley had come up from Eastbourne, specially for the occasion, Millie refusing to be married by Mr. McPhee. The ceremony dragged its mournful course to the point where Millie and Charlie had become man and wife. Mr. Sopley then plunged into a lugubrious address full of dreary foreboding. He spoke of orphans, widowhood, plague, and famine, the uncertainty of human life, and the persistent quality of sin. "'He ain't much at marrying,' whispered Bindle to Mr. Hearty. "'But he ought to be worth a rare lot for funerals.' Mr. Hearty turned and gazed at Bindle uncomprehendingly. It was Bindle who snatched the first kiss from the bride, and it was he who, in the vestry, lightened the depressing atmosphere by his cheerfulness. Mrs. Hearty, in mauve and violet, dabbed her eyes and beat her breast with rigid impartiality. Mr. Hearty strove to brush his hat into respectability. Millie, clinging to her soldier husband, stood with downcast eyes. Bindle looked at her with interest, as she stood a meek and charming figure in a coat and skirt of Puritan grey, and a toque of the same shade. Mr. Sopley shook hands mechanically with everybody, casting his eyes up to heaven, as if mournfully presaging the worst. "'About the gloomiest old cove I ever come across,' whispered Bindle to Mrs. Hardy, whereat she collapsed upon a seat and heaved with silent laughter. It was Bindle who broke up the proceedings. "'Now then, Charlie, op it. I'm hungry,' he said, and Charlie Dixon, who had seemed paralyzed, moved towards the vestry door. It was Bindle who held on Mr. Hardy's hat when he entered his carriage, and it was Bindle who heaved and pushed Mrs. Hardy until she was able to take her place beside her lawful spouse. It was Bindle who went back and captured the vague and indeterminate Mr. Sopley, and brought him in the last carriage, that he might participate in the wedding breakfast. "'Come along, sir,' he said to the pastor. "'Never mind about Evan. Let's come and cut old Artie's pineapple. That'll make him ratty.' During the journey, Bindle went on to explain that Mr. Hearty never expected a guest to have the temerity to cut a pineapple when placed upon his hospitable board. "'Is that so?' remarked Mr. Sopley, not in the least understanding what Bindle was saying. "'It is,' said Bindle solemnly. "'You see, they goes back into stock.' "'Ah,' remarked Mr. Sopley, gazing at the roof of the carriage. "'Clever old bird, this,' muttered Bindle. "'About as brainy as a cock-sparrow what's had the wind knocked out of him.' When Bindle entered the Hearty's dining-room, he found the atmosphere one of unrelieved gloom. Mrs. Hearty was crying. Mr. Hardy looked nervously solemn, Mrs. Bindle was uncompromisingly severe, and the other guests all seemed intensely self-conscious. The men gazed about them for some place to put their hats and umbrellas. The women wondered what they should do with their hands. At the further end of the room stood Millie and Charlie Dixon, Millie's hand still tucked through her husband's arm. Never was there such joylessness as in Mr. Hardy's dining-room that morning. "'Allo, allo!" cried Bindle as he entered with Mr. Sopley. "'Ain't this a jolly little crowd!' Millie brightened up instantaneously. Charlie Dixon looked relieved. Mr. Hearty dashed forward to welcome Mr. Sopley, tripped over Bindle's cane, which he was holding awkwardly, and landed literally on Mr. Sopley's bosom. Mr. Sopley stepped back and struck his head against the edge of the door. "'Look at Hardy trying to kiss old woe and whiskers,' remarked Bindle audibly. Millie giggled. Charlie Dixon smiled. Mrs. Bindle glared, and the rest of the guests looked either disapprovingly at Bindle, or sympathetically at Mr. Hardy and Mr. Sopley. 
Mrs. Hardy collapsed into a chair and began to undulate with mirth. "'Couldn't we have an im?' suggested Bindle. Mr. Hearty looked round from abjectly apologising to Mr. Sopley. He hesitated a moment and glanced towards the harmonium. "'Uncle Joe is only joking, father,' said Millie. Mr. Hearty looked at Bindle reproachfully. "'Now then, let's set down,' said Bindle. After much effort and a considerable expenditure of physical force, he managed to get the guests seated at the table. At a sign from Mr. Hardy, Mr. Sopley rose to say grace. Everyone but Bindle was watching for movement, and a sudden silence fell on the assembly from which Bindle's remark stood out with clear-cut emphasis. "'Old Hardy playing hockey with his top hat under—' Then Bindle stopped, looking about him with a grin. Gravely and ponderously, Mr. Sopley besought the Lord to make the assembly grateful for what they were about to receive, and amidst a chorus of amens the guests resumed their seats. The wedding party was a small one. For once Mr. Hardy had found that patriotism was not at issue with economy. The guests consisted of the bridegroom's mother, a gentle, sweet-faced woman with white hair and a sunny smile, her brother-in-law, Mr. John Dixon, a red-faced hurly-burly type of man, a genial loud-voiced John Bull, hearty of manner and heavy of hand, and half a dozen friends and relatives of the Hartys. At the head of the table sat Millie and Charlie Dixon, at the foot was Mr. Sopley. The other guests were distributed without thought or consideration as to precedence. Bindle found himself between Mrs. Dixon and Mrs. Hearty. Mrs. Bindle was opposite where she had planted herself to keep watch. Mr. Hardy sat next to Mrs. Dixon, facing Mr. Dixon, whose uncompromising stare Mr. Hardy found it difficult to meet with composure. Alice, the maidservant, reinforced by her sister Bertha, heavy of face and flat of foot, attended to the wants of the guests. The meal began in constrained silence. The first episode resulted from Alice's whispered inquiry if Mr. Dixon would have lime juice or lemonade. "'Beer!' cried Mr. Dixon in a loud voice. Alice looked across at Mr. Hardy, who, being quite unequal to the situation, looked at Alice, and then directed his gaze toward Mr. Sopley. "'I beg pardon, sir,' said Alice. "'Beer!' roared Mr. Dixon. Everybody began to feel uncomfortable except Bindle, who was watching the little comedy with keen enjoyment. "'We, we,' began Mr. Hardy, "'we don't drink beer, Mr. Dixon.' "'Don't drink beer?' cried Mr. Dixon in the tone of a man who has just heard that another doesn't wear socks. "'Don't drink beer?' Mr. Hardy shook his head miserably, as if fully conscious of his shortcomings. "'Extraordinary!' said Mr. Dixon. "'Most extraordinary!' "'Well, I'll have a whiskey and soda,' he conceded magnanimously. Mr. Hardy rolled his eyes and cast a languishing glance in the direction of Mrs. Bindle. "'We are temperance,' said Mr. Hardy. What? roared Mr. Dixon incredulously. Temperance? Temperance at a wedding? Always, said Mr. Hardy. Hmm, snorted Dixon. He glared down the length of the table as if the guests comprised a new species. Alice repeated her question about the lemonade and lime juice. I should be sick if I drank it, said Mr. Dixon crossly. I'll have a cup of tea. He's like me, mum, said Bindle to Mrs. Dixon, who was greatly distressed at the occurrence. He likes his glass of beer and ain't none the worse for it. Mrs. Dixon smiled understandingly. The meal continued, gloomily silent, or with whispered conversations, as if the guests were afraid of hearing their own voices. Bindle turned to Mrs. Hearty. Look here, Martha, he cried. We ain't a very cheer old crowd, are we? Ain't you got none of them naughty stories of yours to tell just to make us laugh? Mrs. Hardy was in the act of conveying a piece of chicken to her mouth. The chicken and fork dropped back to the plate with a jangle, and she leaned back in her chair, heaving and wheezing with laughter. "'Look here, sir,' said Bindle, addressing Mr. Sopley, who temporarily withdrew his eyes from the ceiling. "'I had a little argument with a cove the other day as to where this ear was to be found. I said it's from the Bible. He says it's from the Pinkin.' Bindle looked round to assure himself that he had attracted the attention of the whole table. "'Now this is it.' the lord said unto moses come forth and he come fifth and lorst the cup mrs dixon smiled millie and charlie dixon laughed but mr dixon threw himself back in his chair and roared mr hardy looked apprehensively at mr sopley who regarded bindle with uncomprehending eyes 
you've lost your money mr bindle you've lost your money it's the pinkin i'll bet my life on it choked mr dixon best thing i've heard for years pon my soul it is he cried mr bindle i'm afraid you're a very naughty man said mrs dixon gently me mum inquired bindle with assured innocence me naughty that's jest where you're wrong mum when i die it ain't the things i done what i shall be sorry for but the things what i ain't done and as for arty he'll be as sorry for himself as ginger was when he got a dose of twins bindle remember there are ladies present cried the outraged mrs bindle from the other side of the table it's all right mrs b said bindle reassuringly these was gentlemen twins the meal progressed solemn and joyless few remarks were made but much food and drink was consumed bindle made a point of cutting both the pineapples that adorned the table delighting in the anguish he saw on mr hearty's face if only they had a drink groaned bindle it was sort of wake em up but what can you do on lemonade and glass ginger can't even have stone ginger cause they're sort of afraid it might make em tight when everyone had eaten to repletion mr hearty cast a glance round and then with the butt end of a knife rapped loudly on the table there was a sudden hush mr hearty looked intently at mr sopley who was far away engaged in a contemplation of heaven via the ceiling bindle began to clap which brought mr sopley back to earth seeing what was required of him he rose with ponderous solemnity and in his best grief and woe manner proceeded to propose the health of the bride in a sepulchral voice reminiscent of a damp church of england service in the country dear friends he raised a pair of anguished eyes to the green and yellow paper festoons that trailed from the electrolier above the dining-table to various picture nails on the walls he paused his lips moving slowly and impressively then aloud he continued dear friends of all the ceremonies that attend our brief stay in this vale of tears marriage is infinitely the most awful ear ear from bindle and murmurs of hush it is a contract entered into uh, uh, in the sight of heaven but with uh, uh, the almighty's blessing it may be a linking of hands of two of uh, god's creatures as they pass down the uh, uh, valley of the shadow of death to eternal and lasting salvation mr sopley paused ear i say sir broke in bindle cheer up this ain't a funeral there were murmurs of hush mrs hardy began to cry quietly mr hearty appeared portentously solemn mrs bindle looked almost cheerful we see two young people resumed mr sopley having apparently renewed his store of ideas from a further contemplation of the ceiling on the threshold of life with all its disappointments and temptations all its sin and misery all its fears and misgivings we know that we know we have evidence of mr sopley lost the thread of his discourse and once more returned to his contemplation of mr hearty's ceiling bindle beat his fist on the table but was silenced by a hush from several of the guests marriages continued mr sopley marriages are made in heaven i knew you was going to say that sir broke in bindle cheerfully ear stop it he yelled stooping down to rub his shin who's a kickin me under the table he fixed a suspicious eye upon a winter-worn spinster in a view rose satin blouse sitting opposite marriage is a thing of terrible solemnity resumed mr sopley not to be entered upon lightly or with earthly thoughts it is symbolical of many things sometimes terrible things ear ear interposed bindle but throughout all its vicissitudes in spite of all earthly woes desolation and despair it should be remembered that there is one above to whom all prayers should be directed and in whom all hope should be reposed in the course of the long life that the lord has granted me i have joined together in holy wedlock many young couples shame from bindle and a laugh from mr dixon and i hope our young friends here will find in it that meed of happiness which we all wish them in spite of the entire lack of conviction with which mr sopley wished the bridal pair happiness he resumed his seat amidst murmurs of approval
his words were too solemn to be followed by applause from any one save bindle who tapped the table loudly with the butt end of his knife everyone looked towards charlie dixon who in turn looked appealingly at bindle interpreting the glance to mean that bindle contemplated replying mrs bindle kicked him beneath the table ere who's kicking me on the shins again he cried as he rose mrs bindle frowned at him oh it's you is it he remarked now charlie you see what's going to appen when you know you're married been kicking my shins all the morning she has me with various veins in my legs too bindle looked at millie it was obvious that she was on the point of tears charlie dixon was gazing down at her solicitously mr dixon was clearly annoyed at the conclusion of mr sopley's address he had cleared his throat impressively as if prepared to enter the lists mrs dixon gazed anxiously at her son mr hardy looked at mrs bindle mrs bindle's eyes were fixed on bindle bindle rose deliberately if ever i wants to get married again began bindle looking at mr sopley i'll come to you sir to tie me up it'll sort of prepare me for the worst but i got to wait till mrs b ops it with the lodger not old guppy he added he's gone mr dixon laughed loudly into mrs bindle's cheeks there stole a flush of anger well continued bindle i promised charlie that he shouldn't have no speeches to make and so i'm on my hind legs a givin thanks for all them cheerful things what we just heard about i ain't altogether a believer in how to be happy though married but this ere gentleman bindle indicated mr sopley by a jerk of his thumb well he can give me points no one didn't ought to have such ideas what ain't done time for bigamy i can see now why there ain't no givin and takin in marriage up there and bindle raised his eyes to the ceiling i got a new respect for evan i have i don't rightly understand what he means by a veil o tears or walkin hand in hand along the valley of the shadow perhaps they're places he's been to abroad i seen a good deal o wanderin hand in hand along the river between putney and Amersmith. i'm a special you know i had to ask the sergeant to change my duty used to make me ot all over it did there's one thing where you're wrong sir bindle turned to mr sopley who reluctantly brought his eyes down from the ceiling to gaze vacantly at bindle you said this ere marriage was made in heaven well it wasn't it was made in fulham mrs dixon smiled mr dixon guffawed mr hardy looked anxiously from mrs bindle to mr sopley i made it myself so i ought to know proceeded bindle i seen a good deal of them two kids he looked affectionately at millie and if they ain't goin to be appy and fulham instead o wanderin about vales and valleys a snivellin you got one up against joe bindle i remember once earin a parson say that when we died and went to the sort of old bailey in the sky we should be asked if we'd ever done anybody a good turn if we had then we'd got a sportin chance when i'm dead i can see myself a-knockin at them golden gates of heaven sort o registered letter knock what means an answer's wanted when they ask me if i ever done anyone a good turn i shall say i got millikins and charlie dixon tied up right o old sport they'll say up in and i shall nip in quick before they can bang the gates too like they do in the tube then i shall see old arty all wings and whiskers a playin ragtime on an arp again mr dixon's hearty laugh rang out splendid he cried splendid i seen a good deal of marriage one way and another me and mrs b have been tied up a matter o nineteen years and look at her don't she look happy everybody turned to regard mrs bindle then continued bindle there's arty look at him one of the jolliest coves i know mechanically all eyes were directed towards mr hearty it all depends how you goes about marriage there's one thing you got to remember before you gets married bottles is returnable likewise new laid eggs what ain't new laid but you can't return your missus not even if you pays the carriage it's a lifer is marriage i ain't going to make a long speech because the pubs close at half past two and you'll all want to wash the taste of this ere lemonade out of your mouths bindle paused and looked at the now happy faces of millie and charlie dixon for a moment he gazed at them then with suddenness he resumed his seat conscious that his voice had failed him and that he was blinking and swallowing with unnecessary vigour the silence was broken only by the loud thumping on the table of mr dixon bravo he cried bravo one of the best speeches i've ever heard excellent splendid everybody looked at everybody else as if wondering what would happen next 
and obviously deploring Mr. Dixon's misguided enthusiasm. Alice solved the problem by entering and whispering to Millie that the taxi was at the door. This was a signal for a general movement, a pushing back of chairs and shuffling of feet as the guests rose. Charlie Dixon walked across to Bindle. "'Get us off quickly, Uncle Joe, will you?' he whispered. "'Millie doesn't think she can stand much more.' right o Charlie,' replied Bindle. "'Leave it to me.' "'Now then, hurry up, hurry up,' he called out. "'You'll lose that train. Come along. Once aboard the motor and the gal is mine. Now, Charlie, where's your cap? I'll see about the luggage.' Almost before anyone knew what was happening, they were gazing at the tail end of a taxicab being driven rapidly eastward. When it had disappeared over the bridge, Bindle turned away and found himself blinking into the moist eyes of Mrs. Dixon. He coughed violently, then, as she smiled through her tears, he remarked, "'Ain't I an old fool, Mum?' he said. "'Mr. Bindle,' she said in a voice that was none too well under control, "'I think you have been their fairy godmother.' "'Well, I am a bit of an old woman at times,' remarked Bindle, swallowing elaborately. "'Now I must run after my little bit of Evan, or else she'll be off with old woe and whiskers. It's wonderful how misery seems to attract some women.' He took two steps towards the door, then turning to Mrs. Dixon said, "'Don't you worry, Mum. He'll come back all right. God ain't a-going to spoil the happiness of them two young kids.' Mrs. Dixon's tears were now raining fast down her cheeks. "'Mr. Bindle,' she said, "'you must be a very good man.' Bindle stared at her for a moment in astonishment, and then turned and walked through the hearty's private door. "'Well, I'm blowed,' he muttered. "'Fancy her a-sayin' that.' I wonder what old Artie would think. Well, I'm blowed. Here, come along, sir, he cried to Mr. Dixon. It's a quarter past two. We just got a quarter of an hour. And the two men passed down the high street in the direction of Putney Bridge. End of chapter 16 End of The Adventures of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins Read by Don W. Jenkins Rancho San Diego, California Shaggybark.blogspot.com